Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Your Dose, where we speak to individuals with lived mental health experiences to help people feel less alone and more connected. And today we are speaking to Charlie, who is a 23-year-old psychotherapist at a leading private mental health facility in Manchester, and also the founder of an online mental health platform that focuses on providing affordable psychological therapies and counselling services. Charlie has um, ran multiple ultramarathons, solo half Ironmans and competed in boxing and martial arts events. But before any of this, he was utterly and completely lost and battled against bulimia for multiple years. However, after a experience with psilocybin, he actually um, had a complete revelation and realized that he was being completely controlled by bulimia and actually managed to get out of this and find freedom again. This is a really, really interesting conversation and really important when it comes to the topic of both masculinity and men's mental health. Thank you so much for listening and I really hope you enjoy it. Hi, Charlie. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's good to be here. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Have you ever done a podcast before? I've I've never done never done a podcast before, to be fair. Um so it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be interesting. What is it that made you want to do a podcast? I think I think a few different things. I think kind of primarily it's because I think that the experience I went through is kind of unique. Um obviously I had an eating disorder, I'm a dude. Um, I had bulimia, many kind of, I guess, aspects of that aren't conventional. And so I suppose it felt like maybe a bit of a sense of duty to kind of put put something out or attempt to put something out, just in case there's somebody out there. Because I suppose even if it gives one person a bit of a lift, then that would be awesome, right? And I guess kind of, uh, I also, I'm a psychotherapist. Um, I, have, I, run a, I run a psychotherapy platform online. Um, and I guess kind of, being in the in the place where I am kind of maybe at the start of my career and um, it's good to get any kind of exposure as well right and, and I suppose um, all of that rolls together into I guess why why I reached out. So in terms of speaking openly about this how how long have you spoke openly? Hmm interesting question interesting question um because obviously it's quite a big deal yeah. coming onto a podcast and basically yeah. telling your story to whoever listens to this complete, it could be anyone. Yeah. Um, and obviously men don't typically talk about their emotions. So d- did you always speak openly or? I think, I think I've always been quite conscientious to be fair. I've always been quite aware of, I guess, um, my internal thoughts and kind of internal images and, and what's kind of operating within me and um, it doesn't mean I can control it right like that's the that's the game we're all trying to win but yeah I, I definitely am quite aware of it so I think it was very kind of I was very keenly aware of having a problem and also the, the just the way my the way my eating disorder functioned meant that you know it, it was at a severity where it interfered so much with with daily life that you just get feedback from the world which is telling you that you know there is something quite clearly wrong and yeah I don't, I don't really believe in, in hiding from the truth. I believe that even if the truth is unpleasant, you should, you should get close to it and you should get it out. And truth was that I was unwell and I knew I was unwell. And then, so I'd say from the beginning, I've always been, been open to Very aware of it. Yeah. And I think awareness is like an acceptance is the first stage to recovery, to to get in the, to actually accepting it, to go and get treatment. And I think most people, especially with eating disorders, don't accept it for a long time because they some come so wrapped up in the thought patterns and the behaviors and the focus on well for me with anorexia it was always about being being skinny but it was way more than that it was about it was much deeper about not feeling good enough but it presented itself as being thin and that's all I really focused on but then I think when you start to realize it's taking over your life um and you know you're losing friends and all the rest of it that's when you're like okay this is actually a problem and I need to get better yeah yeah what I want to do Charlie is I want to go all the way back to 
pre-eating disorder. Mm. Um, how old were you and what was Charlie like then? Charlie, Charlie was an open book. Charlie, so Charlie grew up with a, with with his single mother, who is absolutely amazing, and she is she was very, you know, she my my mom operates through through emotion. You know, she's she's a feeling. She's very emotionally intelligent. She's very competent. She's you know she's very clever as well, and um, but she's very artistic. You know, very kind of very feminine, um, very kind of open and, and free minded and encouraging, and and so. That that kind of basically meant that I was wired the same way. And obviously the, the slight difference between me and my mother is clearly that, you know, there's quite a big difference, I think, between maybe an emotional female and maybe an emotional dude, and particularly when testosterone gets involved. And I, yeah. I feel like I was very willful. I was pretty impulsive. Um, yeah. I, you know, I wasn't, I, and I, I'd say there was, you know, to a degree, I think there was, there was a little bit of a, you know, maybe maybe a bit of a nasty streak, you know, nothing too kind of malevolent or anything. But I, I, I didn't, I was quite aware of the fact that I guess I, I was kind of young and confident. And what do you mean by nasty? Like, how would that manifest? Well, I think I didn't, I didn't mind throwing my weight around, sort of psychologically, verbally, or physically. To be fair, um... towards others. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, most of the time competitive, I, I did a lot of competitive sport, you know, a lot of like Sunday league football. And um, I played, I played on an adult team from about the age of 15. So I was playing against these like big 40 year old skinheads from South Manchester. So it was like a good environment to just be able to kind of do all that. And, and yeah. that was a good outlet in that sense. But yeah, I didn't really have any discipline. I didn't really have a sense of responsibility. Um, I didn't, I was very much, my instincts were quite out of control, I'd say. And that, that's natural for the age. You know, you're, you're, you're a testosterone, you're an adolescent. You're not meant to have that stuff fully under control. But, you know, I think relative to other other dudes in similar situations, I'd say that I was slightly more excessive than they were when it came to those things, you know? Things like drinking, things like partying, things like... Do you think that's because your mom was obviously this free spirit and very lenient and didn't give you that discipline? Perhaps, perhaps. My my mum my mum gave me my mum gave me discipline. My mum gave me a strong sense of of morality, but it was juxtaposed by also, you know, I think quite an unwavering you know, my mum my mum's an instinctive creature and it is it's the it's you know, it's what makes her so good at kind of what she does and what she what she has done with her life and you know, she's done a lot of great things and always provided for me really well and she was able to do that because she expresses herself and she doesn't doubt herself. And I think that I had a, a streak of that, you know, I was very, very confident in that way. It just potentially yeah. presented a little bit differently for me because, I yeah. think, you know, I just think testosterone has a slightly different color to it than I guess um, perhaps an, an adolescent um, young lady might have, you know? Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. So this was at 15. So this is, this is still before the eating disorder. Yeah. Um, so when did things start to like turn and change? When did slide, yeah. When did things slide? Yeah, for sure. So I went, I went to uni. That was that was the slide for me. That Where did was, you go to uni? I went to uni in Lancaster. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'd. What did you study? Psychology. Nice. Same. I didn't really know why I studied psychology at the time, but looking back, I think my brain. Was... Oh, of course. Like I think they always say that people who study psychology or want to become psychologists are actually trying to figure themselves out. And actually that makes a lot of sense as to why I enjoyed it so much. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. I mean, yeah, I went, I went to uni and, and yeah, things, things slipped pretty fast, you know, things slipped okay. pretty fast. Um, I, you know, I, my, my, I, I, I had a bit of acid reflux. That's how it started. Um, so I had some acid reflux and to control the symptoms, it was kind of like, went to the GP and it was like, you either take these pills or you use diet and things like that. So I was like, hmm, cool, I'll, I'll use diet, right? Like I'll change what I'm eating, eat potentially more kind of quote unquote healthier foods um, in order to not get this reflux. Now the problem being, I joined the football team at Lancaster. I was very active. I did a lot of running and things like that. So you kind of take a young, really active 18 year old who suddenly starts eating loads of really high fibrous, low calorie food in order to control the acid reflux, you know, suddenly I started dropping weight really quick and the first signs were really kind of subtle. You know, I remember things just gone. So how, what was your body like at this point? Were you, would you say that you were like overweight or were you just a complete, were you just healthy weight? Lean, you know, fairly, I've always been fairly lean. You know, I'd say like yeah. I kind of 
12 12 percent body fat you know you know i like okay. I, like, I kind of you, you know i <laughs> i've never had like a crazy aesthetic i'm not i'm not like do you know i mean i've never had like this aesthetic <laughs> physique but like um you know like it like you, you know i wasn't holding anything too much extra anyway but it was okay, okay. But, like yeah you know, i was active and it kind of was it was an appropriate physique for the activity i did you know yeah um, okay yeah and then i think yeah and then obviously that that naturally started sliding as i replaced all these foods with with quote unquote healthier foods that were going to give me less reflux you know salads vegetables legumes all of this kind of stuff really high fiber fills you up really quickly you know etc cetera, etc cetera. trying to avoid fatty things because they can they can stimulate reflux and things like that okay um, and yeah you know things things changed i remember kind of i got cold that winter um, and the cold just didn't go away that was kind of weird i remember kind of I felt a lot colder all the time, just always yeah. felt really, really cold. Yeah. And I also had a skinhead at that point, which was interesting. And I, so I had a skinhead and naturally my, my face just started becoming a bit more skeletal, if you see what I mean. Yeah, can you imagine? I, I noticed this like a lot when the way people looked at me, because I, I started to look quite gone and I think quite, quite. And wow. Yeah, and people, you know, people kind of looked away from me a little bit, you know, I, and I remember that kind of not, you know, people not making eye contact with me anymore, you know, and I think cause really? I was, yeah, well, I was like gaunt and had this skinhead and like was quite like skeletal. It was a, and, and I was very, you know, what, you know, when you're like when you're starving, hungry, you, you, you're like wired, aren't you? You're like, super yeah, tense. yeah, I get exactly what you mean. You know, oh, like, you're like that, aren't you? So I'm just like bobbing around uni. Oh, like, God. Like, <laughs> Everyone's thinking you've <laughs> right, just like, eaten something. <laughs> yeah, literally, right? Like, I probably just look like a bit of a nut, to be fair. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like physically, things just started falling apart. And eventually, like, my memory gets kind of touch and go here. Like, I remember getting a lot of palpitations. I remember getting nauseous a lot. I remember um, eating a lot of of just very odd things. I remember in my room, I'd, I'd store loads of different boxes of nuts and like organize them all and rank order them. And like, I'd tick off all these vitamins and minerals every day, you know, just like really kind of just somebody who's starving and who's having kind of a, 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 you know, these crazy clashes of willpower because their body isn't getting what it needs, you know, and your, you know, your body's giving you all these signals and you're, you're ignoring them. And it manifests psychologically because that's the only thing that you can experience at that time is thoughts. And you get so lost in them that before you know it, physically you've fallen away you don't even know who you are anymore um uh, yeah. so where were your friends in this process did you have friends or did you kind of isolate yourself yeah so so i isolated myself and my you know my friends you know god god damn god bless my friends you know because they 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 are you know they're they're again they're like laddie laddie lads from manchester do you know what i mean and and i think that you know they they didn't, you know, they're not, they're not the type of lads to necessarily kind of talk about this stuff. I mean, they would, you know what I mean? They would talk about it if, if they were drunk or something like that, to be fair, but yeah. most of the time they're not going to naturally speak about it. But, you know, my, my kind of two, three close friends immediately, well, like knew something was wrong and, and definitely reached out a lot. Obviously I was away. I was in a different city, different location. I was going to say with they at university with you now, you were on, yeah. yeah so, so they, they would often try and like, kind of almost like forcibly come and see me and be like, we're getting, so nice. you know, we're getting the train and I'd be like, no, no, no. And then I'd plan weekends away. Cause I didn't want them to see me cause I was all different and I didn't want them to see how like much had changed and how I just wasn't that same kind of confident 15 year old that, that they'd known. And, and I, you know, and I think that's probably one of the worst things about it is, is you, you know, you're losing, you're losing those people for a period of time. Um, I'm really fortunate that, you know, they were there the whole time and, and afterwards they were like, we just, we just, we knew you had shit going on and we, we were there, you know, we're, we're always here for you and we love you and we're glad you're back, you know. I love that. That's so nice. And did they, did you openly say to them, I mean, we've not, what, mm. what eating disorder did you actually have? Oh, so it was proper weird. Like, they, so it was like, but he got diagnosed as bulimia and then somebody said it was like a, a non specific eating disorder. But you know, oh, no, yeah, I've heard of that one. The mental health industry, honest to God, like, they're just so, um, joy happy with the labels sometimes because um yeah it sounds to me like it was very much about like controlling how much food you're having and um becoming aware of the types of food but bulimia is obviously being sick so yeah. were you making were you, and binging and being sick so is that whether that be exercise or food binge um sorry whether that be Sick or exercising whatever the binge whatever you're doing after the binge did you do that yeah so i threw i threw up on occasion i'm throwing up wasn't my like go-to my go-to was um was exercise you know I, i'd burn it off you know i'd, I'd do just crazy laps of of campus running um, yeah you know and that was my 
that was my thing. And it got, you know, I, I'd even, it's kind of what led me into ultra running in a, in a weird roundabout way. But, you know, I found ultra running was more towards the back end when I was actually getting, getting better, but you know, getting it, better, yeah. yeah. And yeah, you know, just, just, and I also feel like exercise, you know, when, when you can't actually change your thoughts, you know, cause your thoughts, you actually have very limited control over really. And you can't actually really change them a lot of the time you can try. That's like the first line of defense. But if you can't change them, the next best thing is just, if you can't get the thoughts out of your head, you just need to leave your head. And one of the ways you do that is by exercising. Exercise, right? yeah. Yeah. My, mine was definitely, I actually did um, my master's dissertation on this, the association between eating disorders and exercise dependence, because I think they often are so, well, they are so highly correlated. Mm. I think if people have got an eating disorder, they are typically exercise dependent as well. Um, I was obsessed with running and it was for that reason, because obviously it was very much about losing weight at the time. Mm -hmm. um but it was also going out for a run and just forgetting about anything that was going on in my head for like yeah. an hour or whatever however long I'd be running which yeah. is great because it's just it's just the only sense of relief because all the time it's just a constant well you'll know just a constant thoughts like t just 24 7 it's draining yeah absolutely absolutely and and you know you it's um you know, and I think there is definitely something specifically about running. I think running is quite like a primal activity, isn't it, really? You know, I think, you know, if you ever kind of look at, um, if you ever look at like tribal societies that are still living in tribal conditions, they're always really, really good runners and really, really yeah. good distance runners. And I think that, you know, I think that what, I suppose like a bit more of a macro level perspective on like an eating disorder is that the first, the first instinct you ever have when you, when you come out of the womb is to eat. It's the first instinct before any instincts take hold. The first thing you do when you come out of the womb is you look for your mother's breast kind of graphic but kind of true right like the first thing you do in life is eat, yeah you know yeah and i feel like there's a lot of the time when you when you're experiencing an eating disorder there's an excess of thought right and it's to compensate for the absence of instinct you're not letting your instinctual self actually live properly you're not actually allowing your instincts to to guide you and fuel you in the way that they're designed to and i sometimes think you see these kind of weird divergence where people start almost taking up very kind of um alternative kind of instinctual activities because of the fact they're depriving themselves not, of yeah the primary instinct is gone yeah, yeah. that's so interesting you know. um so how long did this go on for two three two three two three years um, wow two or three years yeah how did you obviously there's the mental side of it but how did you your body physically how, how was it affected over those three years uh, so I'd say I'd say the I probably split the first year and the the last year and the last two years. So the first year was I guess like you know neat, you know really kind of neck deep in in bulimia and 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 really kind of I guess severe eating disorder territory. Um, I remember yeah. all sorts. You know, I remember I get colds that I just wouldn't get rid of. I get yeah. rashes. My skin got all dry and cracked. You know, yeah. I remember kind of um, random rashes in like in like my like just just like all over. You know, like your body is yeah. just kind of freaking. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I feel like my body definitely became it also became very hardened as well because I had really kind of militant training regime at this time on limited calories so my body you know it definitely became tough I'd say that you know I, I definitely kind of could tolerate physical pain fairly well and physical suffering fairly well during that time and also like when you're mentally suffering it's like you, you take physical suffering any day of the week because you're just like well if I run for 20k and yeah. my legs hurt really really bad I'm not going to be thinking about what's going on inside I'm not going to be no. thinking about my head no. do that yeah inside. exactly yeah, so my body, you know, my body did suffer, but, you know, I like my, the way my eating sort of functioned was quite, you know, it was actually very kind of, it was quite health focused at the same time. I did make sure I was getting all my vitamins and minerals. That was kind of part of the disorder. So luckily, yeah. like that actually meant my body wasn't too kind of worse for wear, you know, when all was said and done, to be fair. So that was, I was really lucky in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like it definitely, you know, I, I was definitely pretty, um, pretty weak there for a good year. So how did you manage university from, in two ways, studying being one, um, obviously you must have done well and, and passed and got your degree, mm. I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, and then, and also as well, how did you deal with the social side of university? Was that affected? Uh, so the, so the, I, I managed to do all right. I mean, I feel like uni, you know, Self, so being self-motivated is always something I've been all right with, you know, and I feel like the transition from kind of 
you know, college to first year, that's often the difficulty is that people aren't getting on your back and it's all, it's all got to come from you. And I feel like that, that was a, a skill set that I'd already developed because I was just generally quite a high output individual. Just for some reason, I just liked doing a lot of stuff and managing my own things from, you know, 16 through to 18. And so that wasn't too difficult on that side of things because I kind of had the skill set that people are often simultaneously trying to develop as they're absorbing new content and information. They're always, they're almost always trying to learn as well how to independently study whereas i've done that so yeah. i just I, I could just focus on the content so i, I felt like i could devour that r relatively easily and and um was okay that that. yeah so the, the so i mean the social front i basically didn't partake I, I partook in freshers and then i stopped drinking alcohol for two years actually so i was sober for two years um teetotal didn't touch a thing um and then i broke my sobriety by fucking eating 60 liberty cap magic mushrooms so <laughs> Oh yeah, so that was like a that was a roller coaster, right? So, and, and this and this is <laughs> yeah. this is linked to sort of the the revelation of all of this this mushroom <laughs> experience, isn't it? Yeah, for so sure. Maybe we need to go into that. So you, so where when did you, so this is like the the, the three year point or the second year point? Yeah. So this this is probably this is sort of between second and third year at this point. Yeah. So you were at university. Were you with university friends or with your Manchester friends? I was with. I was with. This is. This is. Oh my god! I've never actually told this story. And <laughs> okay, let, it's, interesting to tell it. it's interesting to be telling it on a podcast, I guess. But <laughs> I'm fine. Screw it. You know, we're here now. So um, yeah, like I was. I was basically in the P district with my uh, mother and my father-in-law, and I'd actually ran sixty k on a thursday or something so i'd run 60k because i was training for this 50 mile ultra marathon still struggling with an eating disorder at this point yeah yeah so i yeah i definitely had that dog in me at that point you know i was i was for some reason just dialed in like i just i didn't care you know i just didn't i did not care like i just stopped caring about my about okay I just stopped, yeah I just stopped caring at this point you know two years into an eating disorder you know genuinely kind of looking back on the last two years all my friends had having a great time and me just kind of struggling with this thing and not even partaking in any of that stuff that I thought I was going to be partaking in I just kind of I'd sort of given up a little bit you know it was two years like I tried a bunch of different therapy and stuff it just hadn't hit the spot I was still kind of counting all my calories and, and everything and it, it was just kind of it was a bit of a it was a bit of a make or break weekend now I look back really can I ask you a question before we go into the mushroom experience? Um, did your mum notice this? I mean, she must have done. And how did your mum deal with it? And I guess your father-in-law as well. Yeah. So my so my mum noticed it noticed it first. You know, and my mum. So my mum's immediate reaction was like a typical mother's reaction was like, "Come home." You know, you're just coming home. I'm not having it. You're coming home. And I was like, "Mum, that's not happening. I'm not coming home." Um, and like, you know, she was just. You know, she just knew, you know, mother's intuition, right? Like, you just know when something with your kid's not right. And she just knew, knew like, pretty much from the second, from the get-go, you know? Um, and so she, basically for, I think she she really, really, really wanted to help me and couldn't. And I think that absolutely broke her, to be honest. I think that absolutely broke her in heart. To yeah. kind of, you know, have have Because she's always been able to fix my problems, you know? she Because she, she's, she's always provided really well for me. So yeah. you know, if I had a problem at school, if I had a, if any problem, my mom could just kind of helicopter in and be like, oh, no, 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 it's fine, whatever, here we go, you're sorted. And this was a problem that she didn't have the equipment and the insight or the ability to really intercede and, and fix this problem for me. And I think that's the way it had to be. You know, I, I had to fix this thing. I, I had to do the do the hard yards myself on my own. And that was part of me separating from her because we're so close. You know, it's just me and her for so long. You know, we're very, you know, we need, it, that separation was always going to be difficult. And the eating disorder definitely accelerated that. And it, it was very, very difficult for my mom as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, she probably felt, just like she she just couldn't do anything i mean you've got to be the one to know well i guess if treatment's not working either in therapy this really limited amount that your mom can do no no she other did. than just be there for you and she, um, she, she you know she she did you know she kind of would she kind of initiated the therapy thing but she'd also basically kind of force you know she whenever she did just unwaveringly like force me to eat something you know just like militant mother like no no you're having that you're having that you're having that and i'd do it because she was like you need to put the weight on and then like i'd then for the next five days i'd be compensating for the fact she'd force me to do that then she'd see the compensation and be like oh crap like oh sorry oh yeah. rubbish um no, you can swear on this podcast, by is the that way. Right? Is that right? Yeah, it's like, oh, absolutely shit. fine. Yeah, <laughs> don't worry. She'd like, oh, shit. like she'd be like, "Oh shit!" Like this isn't. I just don't get what I can do here. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, I mean, it. You know, it was. It was really. 
really, really hard for her, you know, and I think she, you know, she kind of, you know, I think she, I think, to, I think in a, in a, not, a really odd kind of way, she, her eating kind of changed a, a little bit as well, because I think she was trying to understand what was going on. Um, so actually she kind of... Had, to make you feel more comfortable, she'd like eat less or... She, she just hated thinking about food. She hated thinking about food because it just brought to mind what was going on with me. So she just was trying oh, to... Really? Well. Um, yeah, she's pretty heartbreaking, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely hard for parents to watch, especially if a, fa a fairly young... Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, not fairly, a young adult, or maybe not even an adult at this point. Yeah, no. Oh, barely. Still, barely even an adult, just mm. literally falling away in front of your eyes. It's difficult. Yeah. But back to the mushroom story. Yeah. Very intrigued about this. Yeah. So you went to the Peak District with your with your <laughs> mom and your father in law. Yeah. And... <laughs> God, that is not the way to start that story, is it? It doesn't sound like it makes sense, does it? But yeah, so that that had happened, and basically, I'd gone for. <laughs> I'd gone for I'd gone for it. We'd gone to walk the dogs. Um, it was just me and my mum at this point. My father and I had gone home, so we'd gone to walk the dogs. I've ran this sixty k like a few days before, so I've not exercised for the past couple of days, and um, which was really unusual for the time. Um, but so I go for this walk, and notice the magic mushrooms, right? And like I, I'd read this book called How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, and he's a journalist who did loads of research on how the effects of psychedelics on mental health and using it to treat trauma and using it to treat all these various mental health conditions and how it kind of got pushed out of mainstream psychology, but it was actually really beneficial. And I obviously kind of was always a bit reluctant, hesitant from kind of a safety perspective, you know, um, but then obviously I did my research and, you know, the, these things are, you know, they're ridiculously safe. No, you know, you don't die from, from taking magic mushrooms on their own. If you start mixing and playing around with stuff and partying, it's different, you know, these, but they're not, they're not the demon they've been painted to be. Um, and these were obviously growing in the ground and oh so you literally picked them out of the ground and how did you find them how did you know what they looked like so it's, it's, it's a weird analogy but they kind of look like a witch's hat crossed with a nipple if you're in the uk so it's really weird right. they literally have like a little nipple bit coming out the top and then it's also kind of shaped like a witch's hat below but they, they're called liberty caps and they're um they're just like you literally just see them in grass and usually they it's like I don't want to get too in depth on how to find them because I feel like that's illegal. But <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you can see them, but they they do they have like a like a and a nipple's like such a weird word, but it's like it's like a nipple like structure with like a witch okay, um, interesting. Yeah. So um, yeah, but I I grabbed them and. <laughs> Was I, your mom with you at the time? Nah. So so um, I actually obviously I, I had some like uh, doggy bags because we were walking the dogs, and um, I was just said to my mom, oh, like I'm just gonna hand back and chill for a bit. So she she went and walked the dogs home and. Yeah, I just, I, just, I just grabbed them. Yeah. Did you eat them then? Or no, nah, not no, nah, no. Nah. So then, so then, uh, my my mum left as well. Um, so it was just me. I was just gonna stay for the last night, and I kind of said, "Oh, I want to hang out and stay. I've not got to be back for anything, and we've still got the house for another day, so I'm gonna stay." Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I think to to kind of set the scene a, li a little bit, a little bit of context, like you know, this is after two years of sobriety. This wasn't like a. It sounds like a really casual, like, "Oh, they're just here. I'm gonna do it," but it it wasn't. You know, I'd read quite a few books on it. Um. I'd have, I'd had two years away from alcohol, two years away from any kind of substance that was in any way mind altering. Um, it wasn't a kind of, you know, it just wasn't, I wasn't trying to get high, you know, I was just, I was really unwell and I was desperate to be quite honest. Like, so that was, that was like the catalyst for this. Um, so you, had you, had you gone to the peak district with this in mind? No, I'd gone, I'd gone to, I'd gone to train, but I had been gradually just grinding through. So there's a, there's a, there's a guy called um, Ram Das who's like a sixties, a kind of philosopher slash kind of hippie guy. And I'd read a bunch of his books on like spirituality and things. And he's like huge, huge on the psychedelics. Um, he actually died a few years back in 2019 at the age of like 98, which was sad, but you know, he had a lot of, he was, he was big on love, you know, classic kind of sixties guys, but I really found value in his writings. He was a bit wacky, but I, I thought it was interesting stuff. And then there was all the research side of things that was coming through Joe Rogan, right. His podcast with um, Paul Stamets and those guys. And I was like, you know what, like I've, I've, um, I've given the mainstream stuff a go, you know, I've tried to do, I've tried, I've tried to fight this thing with everything I've got. I mean, like this is two years into the battle. Like I'm losing, Yeah. I'm losing. You'll, take, you'll do anything at this point. Yeah. You you literally know. lost every, you're not doing anything. You've, yeah. you're not spending time with friends. You're yeah. probably completely isolated. So I can understand. So yeah. you went back, um, on your own, mm. which is brave. Yeah, 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 for sure, for and, sure. Yeah. And, 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 and so what happened? What was the... Yeah, 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 yeah. what was the moment? Just eat a few at once, or was it just one? Like, how did it go? 
I went for it. I went for it. Cause I, I knew there was like a heroic dose and I knew there was like a, you know, kind of a, a light buzz dose. And I was obviously, I was going for the, the more psychedelic deeper experience. Cause that was what I, what I'd read was, was more sort of required to initiate change in a lot of instances. So at first, you know, everything just kind of became a little bit funnier. Like, you yeah. know, nothing, nothing, you know, things that weren't particularly funny started becoming funny. I was watching Harry Potter, found it really, really funny. Don't know why. Yeah. Just, but they, yeah. I don't usually find it funny, but it became very funny. You didn't, didn't um, feel scared at any point. Like at this point, you were pretty calm. At this point, I was all right. At this point, I was all right. Things just, I was just giggling. And then, um, yeah. And then I think like things started kind of, di- you know, my sensory experiences started getting a bit wacky. So everything, you know, there were shapes, there were colors, you know, my sensory experience really started just kind of dissolving a little bit. Um, which is obviously quite an uncomfortable experience at first. And I definitely, you know, I guess like the context, I was living a regimented controlled life for two years. I was dialed in every day with my calories, my nutrition, my exercise. I had no contact with friends. I'd not touched a drop of alcohol in two years. I was so incredibly used to control to have all my senses. Just oh my gosh. Control. I don't know what I do. To, like I'm such a control freak. Like I think I would. See, this is it. And same, like, I'm such a control freak. I, like, I, I was at the time, like, massive, so controlling, like, trying to control everything in my life. Like, I'd literally just protected my entire existence in this circle of an eating disorder. And so what the, what the shrooms then forced me was, like, this dilemma. It was, like, everything you thought you knew clearly isn't true. And the evidence right before your eyes is, your, all your senses is telling you that. So either you try and hold on to this control that you think you have, but which now you know from this experience you don't have, or you let go of the control. And that that was the scariest point of the, the whole thing. I was so scared of like, just letting go to what was happening around me. I was like, I, I, you know, you're trying to resist this stuff. And it's like, you're trying to stop. No, I'm not seeing that. Duh, 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 duh. I'm not, that's not happening. But you've got to be, but you've got to, because you're in it and you've taken right. it and you can't do anything about it now. So right, right. They you're take- going to ra- gonna ride it out pretty yeah, much. Right. You know, you, you don't take them, they take you, right? That's, that, that's how it goes, you know? And, and, and that was... And I feel like it reached a real head where I was, I was really terrified and I was really scared. And then I was like, this is what a, did you do in that a, moment that you were terrified. What, what? what did you do in that moment when you were terrified? Well, this is, this is kind of, so I was, I was, actually, I, was I was sat in my room, there was a skylight, you know, so the stars were up there and stuff, which is quite, quite nice. Um, but like I, I was, I was sat there and I was terrified and I, I remember I remember thinking like, this is a, this is a microcosm for, for, for my last two years. You know, I've been terrified for two years. I've been scared of myself for two years. I've been scared of my instincts. I've been scared of everything that is, that is in my instinct. I'm scared of letting myself eat properly is how scared I am of my instincts. Never mind in- instincts like aggression, never mind instincts like assertiveness, instincts like, you know, masculinity wanting power, right? Cause I, I, I'm realized that like that is, that for me is a very, it's a very imperative part of me. Like I, I, I recognize that I want certain things and I don't always want them for altruistic reasons. I want them for me because they're going to make me feel good. And yeah. I feel like I'd recognize like my instinct had caused me problems when I was 15 and 16. So I was reckless. It upset people around me. So I was drinking, you know, just being a, being a dick, right? Like just not being a good person. And so I just cut that part of me off so heavily when I'd gone into this eating disorder. And so it was this moment of like, I've been terrified this whole, this whole time, you know, and that's why I've been trying to control everything is because I'm, is because I'm terrified and, I, and, I, and I'm in fear. And that, that was the, the trip just exposed, like, this is what you've been living for two years. And you've, you've got the same way that in the trip, you have to let go of all your sensory experience. You have to let go of the reality you thought, you know, you've got, to, you've got to let go of your fear. You know, I've got to let go of my fear. I have to let that, I have to let that go. Otherwise I'm already dead. I've already died. It's been two years, you know, it's 18, 19. It don't, it don't feel like a lot, but when you've only been alive for 19 years, it's like, that's one ninth of my life that I've been, I basically felt like I've been dead for. So yeah. I'm like, this, and at this point, I don't know if I'm going to get better. I'm like, this could just be it. You know, like this could just be it. Like I've got, I'm already dead now. Yeah. I not let go of this fear. I've got yeah. to let go of it. That's the only alternative. And even if I let go of the fear and I try and get better and I, and I, and I try and I fail and I, and it all goes wrong again, I'd rather try and fail and not live in fear then fail before I've even started because I'm in a cage. And that was like, I guess that's like the epitome of what that, that trip kind of, kind of, I guess, brought to me in that, in that moment. And, and that was, that was when I, when I think the, the first time I, I kind of, you know, I actually felt like I'd, I don't know, I had hope again, you know, I just had hope. You know? See the light almost. Well, the, 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 you know, yeah, the opposite of fear is hope, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. how long did that experience last? 
God, I was up all night. <laughs> I was up all night. I was I was up to like yeah, I was up to like five five or six, and I was I was up late, and you know it was it was a very it was a very unique experience, and I actually I actually have I've been near them once since in the last like three four years. They're really not kind of they aren't remotely addictive, and they're they're not you know they're they it was it was something that I had like looked at, and I I knew I kind of knew what I was doing without knowing what you I was knew doing. what you were getting yourself into. So yeah. after the, so obviously there's this period where you have this um, realization and, but you're also terrified. Mm. Did that last until 6am or did that last for a period of time? And then you kind of came out of that and. Yeah, yeah. No, the back end was cool. Man. The back end, like the last two, three hours, I was just vibing music, you know, looking at the stars. It was all good. You know, but, like, I definitely had like an, think... an hour there where it was ropey. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that was the first time in however long that you'd felt like free again yeah I felt I felt optimistic you know I felt I had I had hope and I feel like the second you have hope you know you're not at the bottom of the pit anymore you know like and it's and I think that's when you that's when you really kind of that's when you're you're really at your most you're really in the most danger I think is when it is when hope starts to evaporate and I think that that like the second you you can have hope and I think just see some sort of reality where maybe it's not all not worth living you can actually then kind of use that as leverage to go right well i'm going to put another foot forward and another foot forward and eventually i'm going to believe that there's something better because the alternative is just i basically cave into the the evil of the universe and, and live in fear and let that rule all my decisions in life in which case i may as well you know uh, what's the point right? may as well not be here anymore right so what happened after that then what did your life look like after this experience so, yeah, so that's, like yeah. straight after this mushroom experience obviously you've been up since 6 a.m you probably feel a little bit tired um <laughs> but you go home yeah what happened well i stopped i i i stopped running from my eating disorder and started fighting it again properly you know and, and that meant every time i felt fear rather than leaning away from it i leant into it and that meant that i was i was i just found things that terrified me and started doing them drinking terrified me started doing that again um not nothing crazy, right? But just like started doing, going to some parties, and that was interesting. And fighting terrified me, you know, like like fighting. So I got into boxing and like martial arts. Um, oh. Had a few winter clubs, had a boxing fight, just did that. And then uh, you know, like also like running didn't really scare me, like ten k's and marathons and stuff. But like the the fifty mile, it did kind of scare me. So that kind of fit in nicely with this new theme because I was quite scared of all the incline and stuff and and all the rest of it. So it's in the late district, and so. I started kind of up in the up in the ante on that um yeah you know I, I just started I, I felt I was kind of terrified of girls as well to be fair um just because I'd obviously missed out on that kind of I guess yeah. like, you know that like oh uni, that uni kind of polygamy that seems to take place for some reason like when like the, the uni just goes a bit nuts I didn't really do that so yeah so did you not were you not like dating or I guess well you probably couldn't date during that time but like were there any girls in like the, the university experience or so, so no really so really quite interesting so my, my actually my actually my current my current partner um when I was really ill we met twice for a coffee that was my only interaction with a girl ever um during that period like yeah um and I we, we knew each other at college so she kind of knew me before the eating disorder she knew okay. me and then has known me after do you know what I mean but um so that's kind of that's kind of a nice a nice sentiment as that well is nice. but, yeah so she she was kind of you know, she she accepted me when I was at my worst, which is which is a really nice thing. Yeah, that's good. Um, I, I really like the idea of what you were speaking about before, like facing the fear and doing where, it, but it wasn't always associated around food, like around your eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So, like, I don't know if I'm see if I'm reading this right, but like doing that fifty mile run was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing yeah. that fifty mile run, although it's not related directly to the eating disorder by doing that it kind of makes you when you and you finish it and you complete it it's like well I can do this so yeah. I can do anything and it gives you that mindset that like mm. any problem that you have in the grand scheme of things you can solve if you have the right mindset absolutely, absolutely. you know risk is, is it's the it's, it's what being young is about you know find the yeah. risk you know find the danger and go into it right that's 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 the the risk of living a full life isn't it you know you find you find the fear and, and you you move your way into yeah, it right? anyway you know? yeah 100 percent. and like you're you know and it's not you know because i think ultimately you know in in some ways having an eating disorder is the hardest thing in the world in other ways having an eating disorder in the short term 
there are little weird exchanges that happen that are just influenced by fear. So what will happen is it's like, right, there's a salad and there's also a big Nando's. Yeah. And it's like in the short term, eating the salad is easier because I don't have to go through all the psychological resistance and the psychological battle of having a Nando's. Right. And so from a place of fear, you do the most comfortable thing, which in the short term is just having the salad. It's just not having the Nando's is, is having, you know, a glass of water instead. And like, when you actually trace it back, so much of our thinking is fear-based. When, when you actually think about things, it's like, I was thinking about the fact this was today because I didn't want to miss it because I didn't want to be late, right? Like you tend actually not to, not to think when there isn't an element of risk within what you're thinking about. And so mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the time, people with you know, instances of eating disorders are not just, um, it's not just a, a, the, the problem with food itself. It's, a, it's an imbalance between emotion, feeling, instinct, and cognition, thought, and rationality. Because with an eating disorder, you always eat what's the right thing to eat. You never eat what feels good, right? You, it's right for me to eat the salad, but then yeah. the salad feels good, right? It's, it's, it's an yeah. imbalance. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's, um, yeah, it's funny. It's funny. It's very interesting. Um, it seems like you've read a very deeply into this subject. Obviously, you're a psychotherapist now, so I think it's it. It probably makes sense to talk a little bit more about that. So obviously, you've, um. You, you obviously kept you you luckily you recovered i guess you went to therapy throughout yeah, this yeah, period yeah for sure yeah um what what sort of therapy did you go to so i went i went to a cognitive behavioral therapist who who actually wasn't very cognitive behavioral in terms of their style which is interesting they were they you know my therapist was very kind of i guess free free thinking in a way and i actually yeah. i was reflecting on this the other day and actually see quite a lot of personality parallels between her and my mom which I think is kind of interesting um but but yeah you know she was able to kind of guide me and I think I think that what that I think that helped the relationship just kind of get a connection straight away like oh, I kind of trust this person just naturally if you see what I mean um, yeah. and and yeah you know she 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 helped she helped a lot she helped guide me through different things um she helped as well from a kind of practical sense because um yeah she she helped me kind of make sure I was shopping and and, and getting things and putting it in the cupboard so I had the option there and things like that and and that was that was very beneficial. I suppose kind of my personal kind of therapy therapy tilt is I guess, I guess a little bit unorthodox. Um, I'm pretty direct. I'm pretty to the point. Um, I tend to be like that with all my clients. I'm like, what's 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 the elephant in the room? What's the thing we're avoiding? And how can we find it? How can we get it out? And how can we get into Pandora's box and and you know throw it all on the line and see what happens, right? And uh, that's yeah. And it's to me, you know, there's, there is no, anything worthwhile is hard. Anything worthwhile is, is, isn't easy. And I think that that's probably one of the biggest beliefs that needs to be broken when it comes to recovery is like recovery is not going to be easy, but it's yeah. harder to not recover. So you cannot recover and spend the rest of your life feeling that way. Right. Well, not even a life, you know? So you backtrack to, so I just about your education. So you did a psychology degree. Yeah. Um, so how have you become a psychotherapist? What was your yeah. education post uni? Yeah, so I did, I did my, I did my um, three year psychology degree and then I did my cognitive behavioral therapy um, postgraduate diploma over two years with like a few placements on it. Then I left there, worked at a private hospital as a therapist to kind of in a trainee role, built up my caseload to a full caseload. Now I manage that part-time with a, with a part-time private caseload, then also part-time running the um, private therapy online platform. Then obviously, like trying to train for random events and stuff. So it's, it's all it's fair. Uh, full on, but a very, very fulfilling role, yeah. I imagine. Yeah, I mean, Im impact, you know, I think impact's important, isn't it? I feel like it's, it feels good to feel like you're having an impact, you know? So um, tell me a little bit more about this platform that you've created. What it's about, yeah. So it's it's affordable therapy for everyone. That's kind of our, our tagline, that's our, our mission statement, that's what we're trying to do. Um, Therapy is £33 on our platform per session, and you're hard pressed to find that anywhere else. And how we do it is we tend to find people who are qualified, but have not yet fully received their professional accreditation. And then they're still trying to accumulate hours. And we basically create a platform that narrows down into that niche specifically for them so that they can solicit their services on a private basis. But we can also offer reduced fees for people who are seeking therapy, but maybe, you know, maybe they're on a, on a waiting list for a year with the NHS, or, you know, 12 months, whatever it is these days. And maybe they can't afford the kind of hundred just hundred plus pounds that you're going to get if you go to a private hospital. So thirty three pounds online, you know, you get sessions. That's really good. As and when you need, and yeah. And yeah. how many therapists are on the platform? 
So currently we've got um, myself and then four others, and then one is also on the way as well. Um, and they see kind of varying caseload, each of them. Um, but yeah, they've all got their bios on the website and you can read a bit about them. You know, we're quite transparent. That's what we believe in doing. I think kind of, there's a lot of, I think in the industry, there's a lot of, I think therapists, I, to be honest, I think psychology is in a complete state. I mean, psychology has existed for a hundred years as a field. It's not been around for that long. And in that time, mental health seems to have gotten worse, not better. So I don't know why, you know, I don't know why psychology seems to think it's doing yeah. such a good job. If you read the studies, it sounds like they're doing something, but a lot of the time the studies results tend to get contradicted anyway. The data science isn't great. You know, they were, they were pushing SSRIs for years and years and years. Then they backtracked on it. They threw magic mushrooms out the window in the sixties. Now it's back. It's all a bit, it's all a bit all over the place. If all a bit of a mess. Yeah. yeah. But, but really what your aim is, is to make, therapy and help more affordable which mm -hmm. i think is ultimately um one of the biggest barriers because like i've i had th free therapy when i was uh, went through the nhs when i was under 18 mm -hmm. but since then i've had therapy and it's like 100 pound a session which is Oh. a lot of money and you can't put a price on your mental health but equally it's expensive and yeah. that's why people don't do it i've got friends who i've spoken about spoken to when they've had an experience or maybe they've got a past experience that they still haven't dealt with and they're like well emily therapy is expensive or if i went free through, through the nhs i'm going to be on a waiting list for however yeah. long which is yeah. so true yeah. um and I think when you factor it down, like thirty-three pounds is actually very affordable if you take away other things that, like, I go on a night out in London and I spend a hundred pounds on alcohol. That's not benefiting me in any way in the long term. Yeah. So it's about um, obviously seeing that that short term for long term gain. Yeah, yeah. And and fort fortnightly, I think, is a really really valid option that is never really talked about. Yeah as it could be i think fortnightly you know you still get the input you still get the kind of you've got it in the diary so if you're having a rough week you can be like ah, oh, it's cool next week i've got this like thing there you can anchor your week to it in terms of like psychologically knowing that if you have a bad day it's okay you're going to have an opportunity to get it off your chest you know you you also then naturally you cut the cost in half by 50 percent. if you're paying 100 quid a session you can cut it down another 66 by by you know reaching out yeah. to affordable therapy as well so yeah and i feel like i don't, know, I feel like I don't want to get too like market -y, do you know what i mean like trying to like guys this this is really good no i'm gonna i'm gonna input a, a little um screenshot in now to your page as we're speaking yeah. um so anyone that wants to that's listened to this and wants to go and have a look i think um that's incredible charlie i think um it, it clearly shows that your mission is so much more about trying to help people than trying to monetize off people's mental health issues which um, unfortunately is often the case so um i really do hope that if anyone's listened to this that they'll they'll go and check you out yeah and don't don't get me wrong like as well like i guess like being being real like it's one of those where you know i've i have like a i have my i have like my private work which is insured work it's paid by people's insurers through their employers so they're not even paying for it and like that stuff is is, is better paid and like i feel like it's you know it's, it's one of those where like i feel like if you if people can afford it great you know, like, I feel like there should be capacity for therapists to be able to, I guess, get rewarded for for, for their work in that way. But then if, if people can't afford it, I feel like at the moment, it's just like a bit of a desert, isn't it? And now hopefully, you know, there's, there's a bit of an oasis there where, you know, you're going to get something, you know, and hopefully that can that can keep you going. And in terms of um, mental health issues that you treat, do all therapists kind of specialize in something or is it very broad just general mental health issues so this you know again again this is like kind of a really this is a way in which in which we differ and it's a really kind of different it's a different approach um and i suppose so naturally people have their own tilts as therapists towards which which um categorizations of disorders they tend to treat better usually it tilts one way between kind of depressive disorders and anxiety disorders so obviously panic eat, eating disorders would, under, would come under anxiety disorders then depressive disorders yeah that, yeah and a mixture of current depressive depression all of these yeah. different things so yeah. people have their own tilts that way and, and the other way i think what tends to kind of really come through across like all the research and all the different therapies is that irrespective of the therapy type whether it's humanistic psychotherapy cognitive behavioral therapy psychodynamic psychotherapy cat therapy whatever it is and irrespective of all the different people you know 
whatever background you're from, whatever age range you are, whatever gender you are, you know, whatever sex you are, all of that, the actual relationship between the therapist and the patient seems to be the biggest predictor across all of these different things. If you don't have a relationship, you don't have good therapy. And so that's what we really try and build our practice around is ultimately like our, our assessment process is super just like, do we actually perceive the world the same way? And do we perceive you the same way? If we have the same ideas of what the world is like and what you are like, then we're going to mm -hmm. be on the same team. And half of that is just the second you're, you're not alone in that sense. It's like a lot of things kind of just start naturally flying in terms of sparks, because it's when you're isolated and on your own, you often don't kind of have that perspective to be able to see um, pathways that maybe lie before you, but you're ju you're just a little bit out of reach. Um, yeah. yeah, completely yeah. agree. It's, a, it's, a diff and... it's different, yeah. And when did you start this platform? So I guess like it's been on the cards for like half a year. I'd say like two, we're probably two months into kind of really kind of building up our, our caseloads. Um, everybody's kind of operating on a caseload anywhere between kind of, you know, two up to kind of 10, 15. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the, that's the crack, I guess. Like we've had, we've had some people on board for say like kind of seven, seven, eight weeks now and getting some good feedback through and that's, that's all great. And hopefully we can, we can continue to grow and kind of push, push out, you know, and, and keep, keep providing this stuff because it's, um, there's definitely a need for it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I wish you all the best of luck with that. Um, I have no doubt that you'll do incredible things. You've had, you've got an incredible story. Um, and you, you just seem like a very good person. So yeah, I, I all hope you'll do, you'll do very well. Um, but coming to the end of the podcast now, and one of the questions that I always like to ask at the end mm. is if there's somebody listening to this right now who is struggling with um, maybe an, an eating disorder or just something, just just generally struggling right now, what is the one piece of advice that you would give them? Fighting and living are inseparable. If you're living, you're fighting. If you're fighting, you're alive. If you're listening to this, then you're still alive. That means there's still something left in you. Go out on your shield, go out with your sword in hand, walk forward because it's who you are. It's part of your character and it's, it's the decent right way to be because sometimes you don't win. Sometimes you lose in life, but it's how you lose. It's how you don't win. And I truly believe you're rewarded for your intention. So have the right intention. And that intention is to go forward and to fight and to live. I love that. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Thank you so much for being on this podcast. I have thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you. Your experience is incredible. And it's so, I just love how open you've been about everything as a, as a male as well. Um, and also about the mushroom experience. Yeah. Um, I've had another person on speak about mushrooms on this podcast before. Mm. And it's definitely interesting. And I think, mm. yeah, it, if it's in a the controlled way and you do enough research beforehand, it clearly can have some incredible benefits. Yeah. So I guess, yeah. I guess one last question then, if somebody has listened to this and has been thinking about taking mushrooms, mm. what would your advice be to do it as safely as possible? Yeah. So I think, I think, I think the way to do it as safely as possible is to get legal. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's legal here. I mean, in, a, in an ideal world, it'll become legal here. There are conversations going on. There are people lobbying for this stuff. And I think that, you know, I think in 50 years, we may look back and go, wow, on earth did we not do that sooner? But we'll see, we'll see. I think in terms of right now though, I'd probably say your best option is actually to go over to, I believe it's the Netherlands. Um, it, there are some, there are some, some legal options there. There are even retreats and things designed specifically for this purpose. There's some sort of, you know, medical supervision. And um, obviously that's financially kind of quite a drain. But again, it's, you know, you're, you're paying for the safety and, and that's, you're paying for the peace of mind so that you know you're, you're in the right place when you're doing it. You're with professionals. It's what they do every day. And I think that that's in, invaluable and potentially uh, the way to go with it. I think that the problem with it being illegal here is, you know, you often, you often don't know what you're getting. And I, I did mention that I'd found mine, but that's a bit of a risky game as well. If, 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 you know, if you're not sure what you're doing as well, because, you know, certain mm -hmm. can definitely backfire and that's, and that's a given. So you know, I think my advice would be at, at the moment, if I, if I could change things, looking back, it, it, you know, it's go, it's go abroad, go somewhere it's legal um, get it done under supervision, get it done properly. Um, and, you know, don't hang your hat on it either. You know, these things show us what we need to see, not what we want to see. Um, if you think that it's going to be a quick fix, it probably isn't. For me, it was the start of the work. It was the start of having some hope again, but it was by no means the end. There was still a lot of climbing to do on your own. And, um, 
you know, I think, I think doing it, doing it from a place of, from a place of want and desire um, will often backfire. Yeah. So it's more, it was, it's more, if you are, there is literally no other option and you're literally at rock bottom. You don't know what else to mm. try. Mm. I think, I think it's, if you're, you know, if, if you, if you are, if you, if you are very closed, if there is a very closed part of you, mm. for instance, trauma, for instance, right. You know, you get these vivid images and things, but they're very closed off. You can't really consciously access them. Sometimes that is a way to open the doors that otherwise will be closed. But I'd also say, you know, there's a really famous quote, which is like, beware of unearned wisdom. And I'd say that that's absolutely true. You know, you're, you're externalizing, you know, your psychological development and growth and you're externalizing your recovery. And I think that it's okay to use it as a bit of a spark if you're out of options and you're desperate and you're already in a really, really bad place. And if you're going to do that, do it legal, do it properly, make sure you're supervised, make sure it's medically, medically sound. Um, but I, I'd say that if you are improving, even if it's not improving as quick as you'd like, then personally, I don't think it's it's necessary in that in that way. I can't speak towards microdosing. I've never done it. I have no idea what that's like. I've done. Yeah, it's quite it. popular, isn't it now? Yeah, so. I, yeah. I have no idea. Like I've done it twice, um, and it was always it was always quite kind of I guess like a, a, a you know a higher dose in a single like a hero instance. dose or whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, the same hero dose. To be fair, the second time wasn't wasn't um, as much as that, but yeah, like it, yeah. So that's probably what I'd say in terms of. Okay. Yeah. Well, very good advice. Thank you. Um, but yeah, thank you again, Charlie. You've been amazing. And I wish you all the best of luck with your platform. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. No, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for sure. Hopefully I've not scared you off podcasts. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's, it's, it's good. It's good. It's um, because like it is, it is just a conversation, isn't it? And that's always, yeah. that's always something that's very nice. And I think making time for that's important. Exactly. Well, thank you. And um, I hopefully speak to you soon. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so much for listening to the episode today i hope this episode has resonated with you and offered insights comfort and most importantly the knowledge that you are not alone remember your mental health journey is unique just like you are it's okay to have good days and bad days and it's okay to seek help and support when you need it you are strong resilient and capable of navigating life's challenges if you found value in today's episode, please consider subscribing to our channel and sharing this podcast with someone who might benefit from it. And if you'd like to hear more about specific topics or have any questions, please leave a comment below. We're here to support and empower each other. Together, we can break the stigma surrounding mental health and create a more compassionate and understanding world. If you haven't already, please do check out our Facebook community group, which is a non judgmental space for you guys to share your stories, experiences, and support each other. As we close the episode, please do remember to take a moment for some self care, whether it's a deep breath, a walk in nature, or a simple act of kindness to yourself. Remember to nurture your mental well being after these conversations. Thank you so much for being part of our community. Um, I appreciate you all so, so much. And also, if you are listening and feel like you could have a story to share, please do drop me a Instagram message, email me at info at vitamindose.co or, or you can also go to the website and fill in a form at www.vitamindose.co. Thank you so much and I will see you next week.